blue raspberry Kool-Aid and did not know uh, where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good blue raspberry Kool-Aid first. And when people have drunk freely, the poor blue raspberry Kool-Aid. But you have kept the good blue raspberry Kool-Aid until now. This is the first of his signs that Jesus did in Cana in Galilee, manifested his glory, and the Bible says that his disciples believed in him. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for every amazing young man and woman that's here tonight. We thank you that we're not here by accident. Uh, these guys made a decision to be here. And your word declares uh, that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. So God, I pray that you would uh, make yourself really real to them, not just tonight, but every day. I pray that you'd protect them all over summer. I pray this would be their best summer ever. Pray for those that are heading, Lord, uh, into new directions with their future, that you would give them incredible wisdom. Pray that you surround them uh, by the right friends, that you protect them from violence over this next season, Lord God, and that it would just be awesome in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. How about you? Um, or just maybe just show of hands. Uh, how many people here tonight that if you're really honest, like really honest, you'd say, in just a little way, that you are still really scared of your mother. Anybody here like really scared of your mother? I come in company. M my mother, my mother's like 80 something now and I'm still scared. Like like my mother growing up, like I wasn't really scared of my dad. Like my, 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 my dad was like, like tough and stuff, but it wasn't really like my dad would, if my dad was disciplining me, it was pretty quick. He'd be like, hey, don't do that. And it'd be just like done. It's like over, finished. But my mother, when my mother, my mother always went to like, like, because my mother wasn't real big, but she was like brutal. And, and so I've got this theory. I don't know if it's true. Some of the girls here, you may, this may not have happened yet, but it, it probably will. I got this theory that there is this like secret ninja mum school somewhere on the planet that, that all girls at some time in their life, they're just like sleeping in bed and like whoo, taken away and trained in the martial art of mumnessness. Because I, I just think that mums have a way of just, like my mum, when she would get angry, she would just like start to like shake and it, would, and it looked like she was harnessing all the power of like the universe. It was like, she was like drawing off cosmic rays from heaven into the vortex of her soul and she was about to release hell either upon my backside or upon my face. Like my, like my mother, my mother would go crazy. She, the first thing my mother would do is she would give me, uh, like if it was really bad, my mother would give me a timeout. And, and not like the modern day timeout. Modern day timeouts like Johnny, do you want a timeout? Which I always like the fact that they ask you if you want discipline. Like, there's, is there a possibility I can say no? It's like, if I say no, is that going to be good, you know? And do you want a timeout? And, and then they like, in a corner. Like my mother, no, my mum would hit me, knock me out, and then she'd time it. That was my mother's. That was my mother's timeout. Or, or she'd just go into banning stuff. Like, technically, I'm now about seven years of age with all the birthdays I've had cancelled over the years. I'm like, you think you have a birthday? You think you're going to get a birthday this year? No. Done. Cancelled. Over. No birthday for you. You think you're going to get Christmas? You're going to have Christmas? No. I'm cancelling Christmas. Easter? You're going to get eggs? I'll kill the Easter bunny. I'll blend him, make you drink him. My mother, my mother would just go, she would go crazy. But they, they get this power on you that generally, you know, they can get you to do anything they want you to do. Now, I know that Jesus, I know that Jesus is Savior of the world. How many of you know that he never sinned and probably never did anything wrong? How many of you know that? Probably he's like the ultimate good kid at school, you know, the ultimate good big brother or whatever, you know. But I would say, despite him never doing anything wrong, he didn't have a lot of street smarts. Like, because here he goes to a wedding, he goes to a party, and he invites his mother with him. How many of you know, going to a party, you don't want your mother to be at the party, because if anybody is going to embarrass you, it's gonna, she's either going to get you to do something that you don't want to do, 
or she's going to break out the photo of you that she took of you when you were a baby, butt naked, on a bare skin rug. It'd be like all your friends around, hi, oh, is it? And there's you, just like, nothing on but, you know, your little bike rack. There. It's just like, and so Jesus goes to this wedding and his mother's there. And then they have this problem. They run out of blue raspberry Kool-Aid. And so the, 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 the party is about to take a nosedive into just not good. The Bible says that Jesus' mother comes up to him and she tells him the problem. They've run out of blue raspberry Kool-Aid. And Jesus responds with a like, a, oh, mom. You know, it's like, oh. he's like, my, my, my time has not yet come. In other words, I'm not ready for this. I don't really want to do this. His mom's probably seen him like do all sorts of miracles growing up. We don't get to see any yet. This is like the first one. But maybe she gave him like, you know, cheese sandwiches for lunch and he prays over and it's like two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun with a side of fries and a large Coke, you know, just, just the way he would roll. So she's seen him do all of this. So she knows he can change the situation. So she says to him, they've got a problem. He says to her, my time has not come. I'm not ready for this. Then she turns, she doesn't even talk to Jesus again. She just turns to the disciples and says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. In other words, I know he's going to do it. You know why I know he's going to do it? Because I told him to do it. And even Jesus is scared of his mother. Because Jesus, you know the Bible says in the book of Revelation that the eyes of Jesus are like a flame of fire. Where did he get those eyes from? They're his mother's eyes. I bet you they're, I bet, she's like, you know, it's like just bearing into his soul and so so she 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 doesn't even talk to him whatever he tells you to do and immediately jesus responds by giving the disciples some instruction and we find out that this was the very very first miracle that jesus ever did i believe that you and i are living in a season in church life where your generation right now have been more hungry to see miracles of god than any other generation before you. That's good. That, that or maybe not any other generation, but at least the last, the last two or three in church. Last two or three generations in church, church has got very nice and very polite. And I don't mean to like bag out on the Baptists, but it's like very, very like Baptist or Presbyterian. We, we've got like nice little tidy services that start on time and finish on time. And I believe that should be how we do Sunday. I believe that Sunday should be like that so anybody and everybody can come. But what's happened is we've chased out the expectation of the power of God. We've chased out that, that, that feeling like that you and I can see the miracle power of God flowing through our life where we're trusting God to heal people and we're trusting God to save our friends. And when, when I first got saved, I sort of got like adopted into this family that I, I'm, I'm always grateful that they reached out to me and they brought me in, into their house because to be honest with you, I don't know if, uh, if I'd be around today. I don't think I would have made it. But this was like, but they weren't like big sort of like people in the church. And they were, to, to be honest with you, they were a little bit weird. Like, like, well, they weren't really a little bit weird. They were really weird. They were a really weird family. But they were, but they were people that just trusted God, believed in God, and we saw miracles. We saw miracles happen. We saw a miracle provision. We saw a miracle healing. And, and, and they just trusted. I remember getting into a debate with the dad. Uh, his name was Barry. And I was like a brand new Christian. So I knew nothing about God, but I thought I did. And so Barry and I got in this conversation about sickness and healing. And so he was telling me how a God could heal sickness and how you could pray for sick people and they could get, get healed. And, and sometimes sickness was a spirit. And, and I debated back, now nah, it's going to happen. You know, your body's like a machine. It breaks down. You're going to give it medicine. You know, you take it to the doctor like you take it to the mechanic. Sickness is not spiritual. God probably can't. So I had this big debate with Barry. And, and so he, he was just really nice and... You know, he let it go. Well, the next day, uh, we're at church, Sunday night at church, and there was this massive move of God. I'm like, people are getting blasted in the Holy Spirit, power of God's touching people. I went up for prayer, and God just fried me. It's just like the power of God just, 
just stand, and I was like, I was toast. I get up, I drive home, and now, I don't know if this has ever happened to you in church, I was like super pumped. Like I was just like full of faith. And so I drove my car home through Brisbane, one of the major cities in Australia, rebuking demons out of every house. Taking I'm going, I take it, and I was, and I had no idea. I'm a brand new, I'm picking a fight in a situation that I had really no authority at that part to, to pick. But I was in this dimension of just like, God can do anything. And so anyway, so I drive home. That's all cool. I go to work the next day. This is how newly saved I am. I'm still smoking. And so I went to the restroom at work to have a cigarette. So I'm sitting on the toilet, having a cigarette. And all of a sudden, this evil presence comes in. I get knocked off the toilet. I lose my cigarette. There's a butt on the floor and a butt in the air. And, and, and my head, my head gets wedged between the door and the floor up to my ear. And I get stuck. And the room's like, <laughs> just spinning around. I'm like freaking out. I pull my head out of the thing. I, I walk down to the lobby. My boss is like, man, what is wrong with you? I'm like, I don't know. I just feel really sick, man. I have no, and, and I was freaking, I was panicking. I got in my car and I drove immediately to Barry's house, I've been thrown up, I'm now, I'm now dizzy. He's like, what's wrong? I said, I don't know, man, but I'm just like really sick. And they laid hands on me. And when they laid hands on me, they say, get off, you devil. And this thing just lifted off me and I was healed instantly. Like the, the big argument I had the night before, so I went down the toilet with just that one experience. And he was in the freakier thing. Somebody drives in the house. They drive in the house. When they get in, they go, man, what happened just now? And we're like, why? And guys, we just saw this dark cloud lift off the house. And so I got saved in this environment where people were like, not afraid to witness. And it wasn't always cool. It, it wasn't always, it wasn't always smart. We would get in elevators and Barry would stand beside me and say something like, tell me about the blood. I need to know about the blood. <laughs> it's like talking about the blood of Jesus. Like, and I'd always be like, uh, it's red. I had no idea what to say. No. But it's this like raw edge of faith that I believe is coming back to the church right now. I believe there are young men and young women that want to move with God and say, we, we don't want to just talk about God. We want to experience God's presence and that God wants to use you. But there are three things that I think will rob you from a move of God. And they're in this scripture. Let me just give them to you before we wrap up and, and, and pray tonight. And it, it is the first one. Think three things that I think rob uh, miracles. And here's the first one. The first uh, thing that robs miracles is when we uh, limit our own value. When we downgrade who we are. When we, when we, when we think like this. Uh, I, I can do nothing. And God does everything. Like you and I can't do anything. And God does everything. But that's actually not how God rolls. This is how God rolls. God says, you do what you can do. Then I'll do what I can do. And then you'll see the benefit and I'll get the blessing. So Jesus takes six earthen vessels. In Bible numerology, the number six represents man. So right from the get-go, number six is talking about man, then they're earthen vessels. So again, the imagery starts to play out that when you think about this could be, and, and then they are, but the, the way that the Bible uh, words it makes them sound really fancy, but six earthen vessels used for the Jewish rite of purification. How many people think that sounds fancy? It really, really just all it means is these are the pots that they wash their hands in. That's what the pots of the Jewish rite, it means that before they could eat and they wanted to purify themselves, they wash their hands, they wash their face. And so these are like kitchen sinks. These are like bathroom. These are six very, very ordinary vessels that are used for making yourself clean, washing your hands. And so there's nothing spectacular about the vessel. But when the vessel gets put into the hands of Jesus, everything changes. It's like you put a basketball in my hand. I don't know what that thing is worth, maybe 10, 20 bucks. But you put it in Steph Curry's hand and it just escalates in value. That's a little bit like, you know, we may not feel valuable, but you put us in Jesus' hands 
and every you take six earthen vessels and put them in Jesus hands and all of a sudden they become this miracle that just changes everything we tend to devalue ourselves we say I can't do anything but the way God rolls is this he says you just do what you can do so so when when Jesus fed uh, or sorry, when they, when they fed the 5,000, we would always say, because it says on the top of our Bible, that Jesus fed the 5,000. How many people know Jesus fed the 5,000? Because you've read that in your Bible, you heard that Jesus fed the 5,000. But when you look at the story, what did he do? He really didn't do a heck of a lot. He's standing there, they come to Jesus, like, hey man, we've been out here all day, everyone's hungry. They're starting to get hungry, they get angry, some of them are getting hangry, and we need to feed them. And, and, and Jesus like, and so what do you want me to do? Like rip down a McDonald's, buy a whole lot of food. What do you want him to do? And like, we're going to feed them. And so he says, well, will you do something? He wasn't like, oh my gosh, man, sorry. Let me get on my dog. And he comes back. Here's burgers for everybody. No, gee, like, what are you going to do? He put it right back in their hand. They go out and they mug some kid for his lunch. They come back. This is all we could find. There's some loaves and some fish. Jesus takes it, blesses it, gives it back to them, and then says, you feed them. Nowhere does it record Jesus handing food to anybody. They're distributing the food. When everyone had eaten, Jesus says, you clean up the mess. So they clean up the fragments and there's 12 basket loads left over. Just happens to be 12 of them doing it. So in essence, they get a basket load each. So what does that say? That says that they did what they could do, but Jesus did what he could do. They could get the bread. They could feed the people. They could clean the mess. And so Jesus said, you just do what you can do. Now, I'm going to do what I can do based on your obedience to do what you can do. And that's where the miracle happens. He says, now you get the blessing of the 12 basket loaves left over, and I get the glory because in the Bible it's going to say Jesus fed the 5,000, even though Jesus didn't do a heck of a lot. Uh, when it... <laughs> that would have been, how awesome would that have been? Oh, I'm preaching the thing just like, crapped on my shoulder that would have been like <laughs> cool and bad at the same time but uh i was gonna say oh yeah so 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 even this like like uh, who raised lazarus from the dead jesus but jesus did a really heck of a lot jesus rocked up at the tomb he's like where's lazarus they point out the tomb and then jesus says you roll the stone away he never rolled the stone away it doesn't say jesus goes shot ah! he's just like you roll the stone away because why because they could do that jesus doesn't even go in the tomb he stands outside the tomb, he's like, hey, get out of here. And Lazarus comes out, and then Jesus doesn't even touch him. He says, like, you do undo the bandages, and you let him go. So Jesus did what he could do, because the disciples do what they can do. And that's where miracles happen. So we often devalue ourselves. Like, I don't know if you've ever complimented anybody in church and said, man, amazing uh, keyboard playing tonight. And they're like, oh, it wasn't me. It was the Lord. Any, anybody ever done, ever, anybody seen anybody do that? Like, like, you did really good on the guitar today, huh? Oh, it's not me. It's Jesus, hallelujah. It's like... <laughs> it is you. If it was just Jesus, we could have picked anybody. We'd be like, hey, you, 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 jump on the guitar, jump on the drums, we could have prayed, and we could have had miracles. But you have to rehearse, you have to learn an instrument. Some of you got here while we're all on our way to church, you're already at church, setting up and practicing praise and worship. You did a lot. Now, I understand God gave you life, I understand God gave you the talent, but there are a lot of people who've got talent and they bury it and do nothing. So you bring what you've got to God, you do what you can do. It's like seeing your friends heal. It's like seeing your friends get saved. It's like seeing your friends come to church. You've actually got to do what you can do, because very rarely, I'm not saying never, but very rarely will Jesus do what he has called you to do. People are praying for revival. God, give us revival. Let our cities and communities get saved. And they never get outside the walls of their church. They're praying because they want God to bring people in. God's like, I'm not going to do that. I told you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Get off your butt. Go out of the world and preach the gospel. What revival for most people is that God's going to hover over the city and go, and people are going to go, oh, well, I should just go to church. And they're just like, I don't even know why. I'm just running. Well, what are you doing in church today? I don't know. I was just walking down the street. I was picking my nose and, oh, now I'm in church. And you know, it's like, 
No, God says you're going to witness to your friend. You're going to invite your friends to church. And, and, and maybe even go and pick them up and drive them here so they'll get here. Now, you can't get anybody saved, but you can give them the opportunity. It's like an altar call. When I preach, I preach the word, I'll do an altar call. But at the end of the day, God's going to bring people on the altar call. Because I can't give them the revelation that he is God. The Bible says that flesh and blood haven't revealed that to you, but my Father. So there's a component in everything that we do where we've got to step back and just trust God. It's like praying for your friends to get healed. God, heal my friend. You've got to do the prayer. God's got to do the miracle. You say, well, what happens if they don't get healed? Well, they'll still be sick. They're probably not going to get worse. I've got a headache. Pray for me. Heal them. How you doing? No, I've still got a headache. Sorry. <laughs> But you're not going to pray for him. I had a headache. Okay, let me pray for you. Heal him, Jesus. Oh, man, the head fell off. Sorry about that. Just blew it back. It's like, it's not going to get worse. And so faith is stepping out and sometimes failing. Faith is stepping out and sometimes not seeing the miracle immediately. Faith is just doing it and doing it enough. And all of a sudden, you're going to start seeing God do miracles. God just says, you do what you can do. I'll do what I can do. You, you are incredibly valuable to the kingdom of God. I believe that at Family Christian Center, we have a responsibility. There are hundreds of teenagers here. There are hundreds of young men and young women just like you. Some of them are tonight are just wandering around the building and then hiding out. Some of them are probably making out under the J-O-N set somewhere. And, and uh, some people in the back of the balcony or in church sitting with their fa family. And, and, and they are, and they're, it's, they're, it's okay, but they're not, you know, we're, we're going to mobilize people to see this generation one for God. Yeah. And I believe that that responsibility is in your hand right now. It's to rise up, start inviting people, bringing people, getting people involved. You are more valuable to the kingdom of God than you really understand. Your value. We, we tend to put it in my hand or pastor's hands. No, the kingdom of God is in your hands and you just do what you can do. Let God do what he can do. And then we'll see the benefit. Your friends get saved and God will get the glory. Let me give you one more and then we'll, we can pray. And, uh, and God needs you, not because he has to need you, but because he cho chose to. That's like a miracle. I wasn't expecting that. I was like, angels would start floating down, egg all over their hair. Is, is, is the, the second one is that uh, maybe just hold that for a second because it's a little soft and I'm going to